My family's connection to the little church at Ravenscliff goes back to its very beginning. Having obtained a grant of free land, my great-great-great-grandfather, George Tipper, and his family settled here in 1871. Huntsville at that time was little more than a small clearing, with only a footpath through the forest to what is now Ravenscliff. Upon arriving, the Tipper family built a log home in the bush. It was in the Tipper cabin where the earliest church services were held. George had been appointed lay reader, and his eldest son, John, was the choir master for the services, using his tuning fork, as there was no organ. It was George's greatest desire to see a church built in Ravenscliff, and in 1874, he, along with the other faithful parishioners, selected a site for the church, one acre of land on a hill overlooking the lake, to be donated from the Tipper Land Grant. Unfortunately, George did not live to see his wish fulfilled. He died in December 1874 at the age of 59 and was the first person to be buried at what would later become St. John the Baptist Anglican Church Cemetery. John Tipper was a master carpenter in his 30s when the family had arrived in 1871, along with his wife, Maria, and their two children. After George had passed away, it was John who, in April 1880, finally received the patent for the land on which the church, the school, and the patron's hall would be built. John prepared the plans. All the settlers contributed liberally, donating the lumber, shingles, and timber required as well as 60 days labor. Construction began in the summer of 1883. Another great-grandfather, Silas Hall, was a young man of just 16 when he hand-hewed the support beams. The church, finished with a board and batten exterior and a four-spired bell tower, was completed in the fall of 1884 and opened for services in June of 1885 after furnishings and a small organ had been donated. One of the earliest weddings performed at the church was my great-grandparents. John Tipper's daughter, Hannah, married Albion Charles May in 1889. Hannah was a devout member of St. John's who would light the fire and prepare the altar for services. In 1890, funds were raised and a new pump organ was purchased. Eventually, my grandmother, Willa May, began playing that organ for services starting at the age of 14. She played at Sunday services for over 70 years, and for over 60 of those years, right up until the age of 84, she did not miss a single Sunday service. In the 1920s and 30s, even when she had a baby on her knee, she would rock the baby as she pumped the organ. By 1906, enough funds had been raised through the efforts of the Women's Auxiliary and the Sunday School to purchase a bell, which can be heard calling parishioners to worship to this day. In the following decade, the congregation applied for a grant from the diocese to cover the cost of a new roof. Fifty dollars was offered, but the congregation decided to delay accepting the grant until they could meet their share of the expense. Eventually, upgrades were completed, including a driving shed, a fresh coat of paint, and a cement foundation, all with volunteer labor in true Christian spirit. Also at this time, the burying ground was staked out. It had previously been agreed that members would have free selection of one block for family interment, and non-members would pay $2 per block and $1 per single grave. In 1914, the Algoma Missionary News reported that Ravenscliff, quote, possesses one of our prettiest churches, yet the congregation is only holding its own, doing this bravely, however, end quote. This story tells of the struggle, determination, and pure grit of the early settlers to maintain this lovely little church. The names of those early pioneers are acknowledged in the pioneer room of the church. In 1928, funds were raised for brick veneering of the church. About 11,000 bricks would be needed. Mr. Isaac Hopkins refaced the church with yellow brick from Bracebridge. A young man of 33, Harold Tipper, carted the bricks from the station. In 1932, 
the stained glass windows in the chancel were selected and also paid for by the Women's Auxiliary. More recently, a lovely addition was added to St. John's, which includes a kitchen, modern washrooms, and a pioneer room. There is also a large porch which allows for barbecues and other outdoor gatherings. Many ministers have served the spiritual needs of the St. John's congregation over the years, 14 in the first 50 years alone. Reverend Lawrence Sinclair was Oxford educated. He left behind a promising career in England to come to the wilderness. Reverend Sinclair ministered to the community's needs for over 40 years, walking to his various churches between Aspiden, Ilfracombe, Novar, and Ravenscliff. He never would drive a horse and never learned to operate a motor car. He was a published writer and poet who received acknowledgments from prime ministers, kings, and queens. Reverend Sinclair died of pneumonia in 1942 at the age of 95. Reverend Joseph Pardo had been incumbent minister for nine years when he died of pneumonia in the winter of 1904. The Huntsville Forester reported, Reverend Pardo was going to his outstation of Ravenscliff when his horse got down in the snow and it was with great difficulty and some assistance that he got the poor beast extricated. Mr. Pardo got overheated and the balance of the drive together with the cold church gave him a chill. He held the service on Ash Wednesday. On Thursday, he was quite ill, but insisted on visiting some sick parishioners. On Sunday, he was too ill to be out of bed, yet he again went to Ravenscliff. In the evening, he attempted to officiate at Novar, but fainted during the service. He was confined to his bed from then until the day of his death. Reverend Pardo was buried in the churchyard at St. John's. Canon George Sutherland first visited Ravenscliff at the end of November 1954. He had just been appointed rector of All Saints in Huntsville and soon learned, much to his surprise, that the appointment also included three other churches, including St. John's. Canon Sutherland served the community for over 30 years and retired in 1990. He is now in his 90s and still resides in Huntsville. To the early settlers, the church was indeed a place to practice their Christian faith, but it was much more than just a building. Every one of those settlers had had the shared experience of leaving behind all that was familiar to arrive in a foreign land to face the challenges of extreme climate conditions and an unfamiliar, inhospitable environment. It was a gathering place where people could connect with their neighbors, to hear news, to celebrate joys and successes, and to mourn together and receive comfort in times of difficulty and loss. The church was an integral part of the fabric of culture and community. It was the very glue that held the community together. In the almost 150 years since George Tipper first dreamed of building a church for his newly adopted community in the backwoods of Muskoka, St. John's has been a focal point for the Ravenscliff and surrounding areas. Those beams so skillfully crafted by a young Silas Hall in 1883 have witnessed the joys of countless baptisms and weddings, the sorrows of funerals, the giving of thanks, the reverence of communion, the grace of the sacraments, the lifting of spirit as souls unite in song, the moments of beauty and awe as strains of silent night reverberate in the mellow candlelight of a snowy Christmas Eve. Over 15 decades, countless volunteer hours have been contributed by generations of community members, too many to name, to keep this special, beautiful little country church going in ever more difficult times. For many reasons, for many people, church is becoming less of a focal point in their lives. Congregations are dwindling. It's becoming more and more difficult to pay for basic maintenance and expenses. Sadly, Many small country churches have already been deconsecrated and closed forever. It is our greatest desire to not allow this to happen to St. John's. Our dedication to the preservation of St. John's is about more than religion or faith. It is about honoring our roots and our cultural heritage, about acknowledging the hardships our ancestors endured so that we can enjoy the privilege of living a relatively easier life today. 
Don't we owe it to them to not allow this beautiful old building to fall into disrepair or to be sold off? After all, they planted more than seeds in Muskoka. They planted a way of life. Thank you.